Pacienījumais Stengel kungs, vēstnieku kungs, amerikāņu draugi, studenti. Universitātē šodien ir liels prieks un gods, kā mūs ir apmeklējis tik augstu līmeņu Amerikas Savienēto valsts politiķis, valsts sekretāra vietnieks Richard Stengel kungs, kurš snieks vieslekciju mums, mūsu studentiem, un katrs no jums varēs uzdot jautājumus un piedalīties diskusijā par aktuālajiem jautājumiem. Mr. Stengel, Mr. Ambassador, dear guests and friends, it's great honor to welcome such an important guest under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Richard Stengel, to give a lecture to our students. I am fully convinced that today we will enjoy an exciting lecture that will be continued with smart questions, discussions about the topics. And so, I'm giving the floor and, uh, to our moderator, Eddie Bosch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, <laughs> um, right, uh, whether you're interested in journalism or uh, political science or international relations, I, I hope, uh, I'm quite certain that you all agree with me that uh, we have an opportunity to talk today to a very remarkable uh, individual. Uh, let me give you just a brief outline of Richard Stengel's uh, CV here. He studied uh, English language and history at Princeton University and Oxford and Britain as well. He has been a writing journalist for uh, many, many years. Um, you were not, uh, most of you were not born at the time when he started writing uh, and publishing. Uh, his best, perhaps his best known book is the one he worked on with, uh, with the late Nelson Mandela. Uh, that's uh, Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. You may want to uh, uh, buy that book uh, if you're interested in uh, the uh, history of freedom and, and uh, South African uh, issues in particular. But many other books and publications, documentaries, over the years. He has taught journalism at Princeton uh, for the last seven years. He was the managing editor of Time. Um, as you may know, that's uh, uh, America's largest magazine publisher, perhaps uh, one of the best known brand names in, in American journalism in general. Um, I'm a half journalist myself, so uh, believe me uh, when I say that a journalist CV uh, doesn't usually get uh, much more impressive than uh, Richard Stengel's. Um, uh, well, Mr. Stengel decided to move on to diplomacy fairly recently. Um, he was sworn in as, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's the title, uh, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. Exactly three months ago uh, today, uh, he uh, uh, began, work on that, began work on that position. So. Uh, we have time until 11.30. Uh, Mr. Stengel has to leave 11.30 sharp. Uh, this meeting here is envisaged as a town hall meeting. So I will uh, try to fight my journalistic instincts and not to privatize the discussion uh, today, right? And, and Mr. Stengel doesn't in intend to uh, give you an address or a uh, lengthy monologue. So. Uh, this is basically a uh, opportunity for you to uh, ask questions, and Mr. Stengel is open to all sorts of questions, um, diplomacy, current affairs, but also about his experience in journalism. Uh, I, I see here uh, journalists, my colleagues and, and uh, professors and students uh, from both international relations department and journalism department coming here. So, uh, you might expect all sorts of questions. I'm uh, not sure where it is going to lead us, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, to a good place. All right, uh, so uh, I will shut up right now uh, and uh, just uh, uh, start us off with, uh, with asking you, um, you came back from uh, Kiev uh, just now, right? Uh, this is a, a challenging time to take over public diplomacy 
uh, for the United States. Um, so how do you envisage what, what sort of a thing is public diplomacy in the first place? Uh, and uh, what, what role does it play in American foreign policy? Please. Eddie, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here in Latvia among such great friends and, and allies. And I've had a very warm welcome uh, already. And uh, I look forward to my, the rest of my day and, and hearing from you and talking to you. I, I know this is a town hall. I apologize for the barrier here. We can uh, move on. When we, well, I don't mind doing yeah. that. Um, uh, yes, it was a big transition for me to go from uh, journalism to diplomacy, work for the State Department. But when I was editor of Time, I used to say that our slogan was to help explain America to the world and the world to America. That's not a terrible definition for public diplomacy in the sense that public diplomacy is telling folks around the world what American policy is and, and why we believe in it and why we support it. It's not propaganda. Uh, it's not trying to make you like us. It's more or less explaining why we do what we do and what are the shared values and shared commitments and shared ideas that, that we have together. And you know, I very much understand that there will be, even when we explain our policy, there will be people who don't like it. And there will be people who don't like us. There will be people who like us and don't like the policy and vice versa. All of that is fine. But I just want to make sure that we are open and transparent in talking about what America believes in and why. And I think there's a, there's a value to that. All right. So uh, how would you explain America to, the, to, uh, to this audience here? Well, the, it's, um, that's a big question. Yeah, it? <laughs> um, and, I, and one of the things that I do feel that, that America has going for it is that our is that American popular culture is, is so popular around the world. So people feel like they, they understand America, uh, even if they've never been to America or even never met an American. Um, at the same time, the, 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 the values that I talk about are values that I think are universal values. Um, a lot of uh, political scientists have talked over the years that America kind of rotates between outward looking and, and inward looking, between, between the sort of real politique of, of, of Teddy Roosevelt and the uh, uh, universal values of a president like Woodrow Wilson. But that ultimately, we all end up in the sort of Wilsonian camp that there are certain universal values that we talk about and advocate that we think are relevant to everybody, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression. The idea is that in the Declaration of Independence that all people are created equal. I think those are universal values. And, and part of my job, I think, is, is talking about those values both as an expression of American ideas and, and how, how that lives in, in every country that I, that I visit. All right. I will have a couple of more questions, but uh, I, I will soon forget that you have to ask questions and I will continue this conversation. So, uh, please prepare if you have uh, anything to ask right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a second. Give me a uh, one more chance. <laughs> well, uh, you came back from Kiev. I mean, that's the, the, the big issue uh, these days. Uh, you have, um, in, in one of your previous interviews, uh, you said with reference to what is going on in Ukraine that you've been really amazed uh, by the power of the Russian propaganda machine. And we, as Americans, as American public diplomacy, we're trying to figure out how to combat that. Um, are you arriving at a solution, or, or is, is this a lost game? Uh, it's certainly not a lost game, and, and I'm sorry I didn't address the Ukraine when you first asked about it. I wasn't avoiding it. but. Um, I mean, certainly we've been completely clear about the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, about the, the disturbances in, in eastern Ukraine that, that are threatening the independence of Ukraine, the uh, integrity of Ukraine, the structural integrity of Ukraine. Those are all things that we're vehemently against. Um, insofar as, as what I do, involved in public diplomacy and public affairs. Public affairs is, is more about communication and, and spokespeople and all of that. I have been um, uh, more or less uh, amazed by the power of, of Russian uh, media, of uh, Russian propaganda, 
uh, and particularly their, uh, the fact that they don't seem to feel bound by any fidelity to reality or to the truth. Uh, it's always uh, hard to combat fictions with reality, but that is what we're, we're trying to do. And I understand, of course, in, in Latvia, you, you know, you're a recipient of so much of, of this Russian messaging. And, and you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is have counter messaging and to combat fiction with the truth, to you know, combat uh, prevarication with reality. And, and uh, I want to hear from you all about the best way to do that as well. Right. OK. Um. Please, sure. Um, what I wanted to ask is you've had the chance to interview the most important figures of the recent times. And uh, you've interviewed Netanyahu, you've interviewed Julian Assange and uh, Morsi. And what I wanted to know, who was the most impressive or the most interesting to interview and why? So um, Assange, Morsi, and Netanyahu. Yeah, who you named the king of Israel. That sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. If you <laughs> walk into a bar, uh, I'll, I'll stop right there. Um, I, in, in my job at time, I did have uh, opportunities to interview many world leaders. And, and when you didn't mention Vladimir Putin, um, uh, I, I do think that you know, one of the things that, that is interesting to me personally, having worked with Nelson Mandela, is that I feel like I've, I've become a student of, of leadership and leadership styles. And uh, all of those d different people have, have, have different leadership styles. And one of the things that, that I learned from, from working with Nelson Mandela, who I think we can all agree is probably the greatest leader of all the ones that, that we've mentioned, is that the most important thing is to have a, a goal and a mission that you stick to, but then after that, everything is very practical and pragmatic. And that he uh, he wasn't ideological; he was a real pragmatist. But he did have one one overarching moral goal, which was freedom for his people, and he stuck to that. And anything that he did to, to get to that goal was something that he thought was worthwhile. The problem in, in, on the world stage is when people have a goal which is not a moral goal, and then they are pragmatic in their pursuit of that immoral goal. I mean, that's something that we're seeing in the beginning of the 21st century. Not to get highfalutin about it, but you know, when the, when the Berlin Wall fell, there was an American political scientist named Francis Fukuyama who wrote a book called The End of History. And the idea was the, the wall has fallen, the Cold War is over, there's no more ideological battles anymore. Now we can all just figure out how to be prosperous. Well, what we're having, what we're seeing now in Ukraine and elsewhere is, is the return of history, so to speak, the return of geopolitics. And that's something that, that we all have to reckon with and that leaders around the world have to reckon with. All right. Um, if I could, yeah, yes, yeah, so hang on to that microphone. I will just chip in as a, as a follow-up to that question. I mean, you have uh, personal experience as a journalist uh, with uh, many world leaders. Some of them are mentioned here. Um, with reference to Vladimir Putin, you uh, you describe him as a Tsar. Right? As a what? A Tsar. Oh. Right. Um, is that just a description of his basically style of governing, or does this suggest something uh, of what you think could be, I mean, as a recipe for dealing with it, mm -hmm. a particular leadership style that needs to be or confronted or uh, or or basically thought about in a very different way than other leaders. So from your personal encounter with Vladimir Putin, what would your suggestion be if someone meets him? I don't know whether I will, I will meet him in the uh, 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 foreseeable future and have an opportunity to talk to him. But unless, what would you suggest to uh, Western leaders who have to deal with him? Mm -hmm. Well, in the interview that we did with him, which was back in 2007, I think that might have been the first time that he said a, 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 a phrase that has echoed ever since and echoed even much more loudly in the last few months was he said the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, I know that must sound strange to your ears as it, as it sounded strange to mine, but what it is is a, is a window on 
his mind. I mean, in the sense that uh, if, as a leader of Russia, to think that the breakup of the Soviet Union is the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, do you say to yourself, well, I want to try to reconstitute that reality in a different environment, which is something that is very difficult to do, but perhaps that is something that we're seeing. So I think, I think Western leaders, leaders around the world, have to reckon with whether, as with all leaders do, or whether you're looking to the future and trying to progress into the 21st century, or you're looking to the past and trying to reconstitute the past reality, which is very, very hard to do. And how do you confront that? Uh, with only diplomacy, with soft power, or you have to go back to the, uh, to the old methods of, uh, of hard power uh, to contain all of that? Well, what do you think America's... Well, I think what China? we've seen in Ukraine is a, is a curious mixture of soft and hard power and the, and the use of very sophisticated 21st century messaging and techniques along with with the kind of harder power of, of Russian troops and interlopers and, and surrogates. And um, that's a new kind of mixture that everybody has to deal with. And um, part of public diplomacy is just talking about it as, as we're doing now and, and putting a bright red line around the, around the problem. Um, and it's a, it's a, this was just in the first chapter of a new, of a new book that's being written. And, um, you know, I can't, I, I, I know how it will end because I think it will end positively for the West and the, and the U.S. and Latvia. But in the, in the meantime, it's still, things are changing every day. All right. Please. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not. Uh, in your global comprehension, during the presidency of Barack Obama, the relationship uh, between the Baltic states and the USA starts to be stronger than before. Please comment why uh, yes or maybe why not. The relationship between, I'm sorry, between... I think the question was whether uh, during the Obama administration our relationship, yeah. uh, this region's relationship with the, Ameri uh, with the United States has gotten stronger or weaker. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, the, the, one of the things that the president talks about and uh, my boss, the, the Secretary of State, is that we're living in a new era of global engagement. And I, and I think that's true. I think part of what the Secretary has done, not only in all of his frequent travels, but in everything that he says and does, is that he tries to, to increase the amount of contact and engagement that America has with everyone around the world, including uh, its allies. One of the things that the, that the uh, incursion in Ukraine has done is it's, it's forced the issue. So, uh, I mean, the, the President has said this, the Secretary of State has said this, the Vice President has said this, you know, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty is an, is an ironclad agreement between everyone in NATO with each other, and, with, and in particular between the U.S. and Latvia and the U.S. and all the Baltic states. So, I think this particular issue has actually brought us in closer contact and deeper engagement and a deeper commitment. And that wasn't necessarily something that anybody foresaw, but that is the practical consequence of it. All right, thank you. Um, Anderson. Um, yeah, uh, I have a two-part question. Um, first would be, um, how um, is it has become more difficult engaging in uh, public diplomacy over the recent years um, because uh, because of such PR disasters as, for instance, the re relations of NSA spying or, for instance, the use of drones in Pakistan, and also about uh, my second part is about the domestic discourse uh, in the United States. Um, for instance, I, I follow a lot. Um, I go online, I watch Fox News, MSNBC, things like da The Daily Show. And you mentioned uh, Russian propaganda. They often use things like Occupy Wall Street or Tea Party as voices of opposition within the United States, similarly as um, the United States media uses Russian opposition within, in, in that, uh, in, within Russia. And uh, how would you um, compare this? I mean, it's not, it's not just strict propaganda. I mean, if you follow the domestic discourse, for instance, what Fox News says, it's, it's pretty similar to what Russia Today says. So uh, is it just really Russian propaganda, or do they use this uh, inner tension, this uh, partisanship within the United States? Oh, Thank you. First of all, I'd say that there's a real false equivalency between 
Fox News and RT, I, I wouldn't say that they're similar at all. And, um, and I mean, you, one of the things that I would say about Russia today, and I know this is an issue here in Latvia, which is that while I absolutely uh, dislike almost everything RT does, I would defend to the death their right to say it. That is part of the American commitment to, to free speech. Uh, that, that, in fact, and I know it sounds strange often to European ear, ears, but as the Supreme Court says, that you know, freedom of speech is not to defend the freedom that we love. It's, to, 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 it's not to defend the speech that we love, but to defend the speech that we hate. And, and so that is part of the reason that I completely support Russia today being on American networks, being on American airways. Um, I would never restrict anybody's speech at all. The, the, the response to speech that we don't like is just more speech and more freedom of speech. That's, that's my attitude. That's basically the American attitude. And, um, you, know, you know, frankly, you know, there's probably no greater uh, answer or, or repast to Russia today than Jon Stewart. Um, you know, I think, I think comedy and satire are the kinds of things that actually can combat a distortion of information and misinformation. So um, to me, the idea of having all of these voices is the recipe for, for drowning out the voices that you don't necessarily like. But I do think they, all those voices need to be heard. There was the first part of that question about whether public diplomacy has gotten uh Harder to do uh, for yes. uh, with the American image of the uh, or these NSA scandals and the war in Iraq and all sorts of yes. Yeah, so certainly, so uh, obviously the Snowden revelations uh, uh, have been something that that has been a setback uh, in in many ways to the U.S. But but I think one of the things that it points to is and and, and this is true even talking about media is that. All of these issues live on a, on a continuum, and the continuum is, beach, is, is on the one hand, two separate competing values. You know, one is the, is the value of security, and one is the value of privacy. Can you ever have, can you have complete and 100% security without ever stepping on your privacy? I don't think so. Can you have complete and 100% values of privacy without, you know, stepping on your security? No. So some, we have to find a point somewhere along that continuum, and one of the th things that President Obama has talked about is that is that we try to do espionage in in comporting with our values, with our values of free speech, with our values of privacy. And again, it has sometimes stepped on people's toes, and it still is something that is being calibrated all the time. And I know, you know, this is something that he personally is deeply concerned about, and he wants to make right, wants to make right with with all of our allies. To go to the point about public diplomacy in the 21st century, which I do think there are great challenges and there are great ironies and paradoxes. So, uh, and I saw this in my in my life, you know, in, in media up until now. At the same time, you have the greatest amount of information that's available to any human being in human history. You can go online and and get access to every book in the British Museum Library that was ever published, and you can be doing that from, you know, from Angola. Um, do you think, well, this is just so fantastic that everybody has this information? Information, once upon a time, through most of human history, was, was a scarcity. Only elites had it. I mean, books themselves were something that were a scarcity. Now, everybody has access to that information, so you think this should be a golden age of understanding and, and, uh, uh, and harmony. But what you're also finding at the same time is that more and more people seem to have a, a narrower view of reality and are adopting, uh, whether it's ideologies or religious extremism, that is not commensurate with this openness of information. One of my great heroes was Patrick Moynihan, who was a senator from New York. And he said, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. You'd think that internet would basically have put that out the window. In fact, what we're seeing is more and more people feel entitled to their own facts and adopt these kind of false views of reality at a time when it's much easier to get the countervailing reality. I don't have an explanation for that. You know, some of the theories are that uh, 
that people now are able to, uh, what, what social scientists call confirmation bias, that you only look for information that already confirms what you think already. And now it's easier to do that than any time in history. Maybe that's the reason for it. But it is a, it is a paradox, and, I, and it does make public diplomacy harder and more difficult. Could I uh, just very briefly press you uh, a bit more on that point? I mean, uh, American soft power is your tool, basically, for, for accomplishing many of the objectives that you have to accomplish as, uh, as the person who guides American public diplomacy. What, very, uh, in a very brief answer, what did, would your assessment be of, let's say, last 15 years? Has American soft power increased or decreased? Um, I, 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 that's a hard question to answer, and um, <coughs> I'm actually thinking Are you about allowed to now answer that question? What? Are you allowed to answer that question? Uh, I'm absolutely allowed <laughs> to answer that question. I, I'm just trying to answer that question. Um, I do think, as you mentioned with the, with the NSA revelations, uh, the uh, concern abroad in different places about, about the Mer American drones, um, are, are things that have, have in, many, in some ways, hurt the American brand, brand USA. At the same time, you have other factors that have been enormous boosts to, to brand USA. The election of, of President Barack Obama, I think you'd find you know, people in the US, even people who did not vote for, for, for Barack Obama, saying this is, in many ways, the, the kind of uh, fi almost final evolution of, of all of these American values that we've been preaching for more than 200 years and trying to rectify. I mean, if you look back in American history, I mean, there are obviously, uh, um, you know, terrible deprivations, terrible discrimination. Slavery was enshrined in the Constitution. We've spent decades and centuries trying to heal the breach and repair the breach. Then suddenly in 2008, you have the election of an African American uh, as president. So I think. That sent a message around the world that that we don't just talk the talk, we we walk the walk. Um, so I think they're they're compensating uh, pros and cons. Um, you know, I would I would tend because I'm an optimist tend to say that the, the the part of the brand of the USA it's increasing in popularity in part because we acknowledge our mistakes and we acknowledge our failures and and we try to heal them. I mean that I think is is the American way. All right. Yeah, please. Um, what motivated you to move from journalism to public affairs? Um, would this not restrict uh, the essence of a journalist? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a good and, and, and fair question. Um, and I do think there's this perception sometimes that um, journalists are this kind of permanent adversarial class uh, to, to government. At the same time, there's another way of looking at it, which is that um, one of the things I did as editor of Time is that I did campaign for national service, for public service, saying that, that it is the obligation of every citizen in a democracy to serve in some way. And so, so speaking of, of, talk, of walking the walk as opposed to talking the talk, I thought, you know, I can't just preach this and then, and then not live up to it. So when the, when the president and when the secretary of state asked me to, to come and serve, I, I felt like that, that was my obligation. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you can be an excellent journalist and, and, and believe in public service at the same time. I think they, I think they go together. In fact, in, the, in a democracy, uh, I would argue that, that journalism, and particularly adversarial journalism, is a form of public service. I mean, the, the, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, a nation can never be ignorant and free. You know, in a letter, he said that you know he would, you know, given the choice between between a popular government and a popular press, he would choose the latter over the former. Um, I, I think all of those things make democracy work. That basically journalists are are trying to keep, you know, government in line and keep leaders in line, and that and and educate the electorate. An educated electorate is the basis for 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 a good democracy. So. Uh, I think journalists are patriots just as much as people who serve in government. All right, so I think, I think about uh, how many how many aspiring journalists are there in the audience? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> you are you are one. Okay. <laughs> uh, All right.
How many doctors? Wow. You mean like PhD? Or PhD. Oh, oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean medical doctors. Medical doctors. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and then everybody else was uh, were PhDs or uh, studying for well, No, no, those were medical students, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, any questions? Medical journalism is a big and important field. All right, other questions, please. One more from Laura. So, <clears throat> so, in your opinion, what perspective Latvia as a political actor, by that I mean as an individual political actor, has in the USA foreign policy. So what is Latvia's role in... in perspective, in the future. Um, how, yeah, yeah, I think the... Uh, how do you see that relationship evolving? Uh, uh, yeah, let me actually put it, that's a good one. Uh, let me put it in a broader context uh, with all of the talk that we have had uh, over the last years about American refocusing on Asia and maybe decreasing its commitment or involvement uh, in European affairs. Uh, and this is something that if you, uh, if you read the uh, Latvian and Baltic states or the Central Europeans foreign policy strategies, this is something that they worry about, uh, the uh, transatlantic link. So how do you see in the future that relationship uh, evolving? Will we see as much uh, of Americans uh, in the future involved in this region as we have seen uh, over the last 20 years? No, it's a good and fair question. I've been asked that before, but I think the, uh, you know, to use a colloquial American expression, I mean, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I mean, you, uh, Europe as a partner is our partner of first resort. It's not our partner of last resort. The trading between the U.S. and the EU is the largest trading partnership in the world. You know, we're very strong supporters of TTIPs, the trading agreement between Europe and America. Um, I think that relationship which is something is regarded as a kind of foundational relationship between the, between the U.S. And, and Europe is something that will just grow and grow. A so-called rebalance to Asia doesn't doesn't threaten that. It's merely a recognition that Asia is the you know the fastest, the most prosperous, growing part of the world. I think what we've seen in Ukraine, I think, will also bring the relationship between the U.S. and the Baltics even closer. I think uh, the President and the Secretary of State see that uh, there needs to be an even closer and stronger relationship uh, you know, in the shadow of what's happened in Ukraine. So um, I, I see the prospects uh, as, as only positive in that regard. All right. Any other questions? Please. Uh, do you believe in correlation between economic power and the like the world's most popular brand as a state? So it's not a secret that China now is competing with the U.S. to be the world's economic power number one. So what is your opinion about whether China will be the world's most uh, powerful economy? Will it take the U.S. place in the public diplomacy among the world, or it won't? Well, well. First of all, we welcome the competition. You know, we've been advocates of, of, of global competition in the economic sphere forever, and that is, is something that we uh, will respond to. Um, I think there've been a lot of misperceptions about Chinese economic power, which is not to say that they don't have enormous economic power. I mean, if you look at the you know, per capita uh, economic power in China versus the United States, it's just not even comparable. The fact that the Chinese population is, is exponentially larger than the U.S. accounts in part for the, for the size of, of the Chinese GDP. But what I would also argue is that the American role in economic growth comes from partnerships where we support all of these values that I was talking about, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, but all of how that manifests that self, manifests itself in the, in the economic sphere. So that's uh, freedom of ideas, uh, uh, level playing fields, uh, transparency in business practices, anti-corruption. I think those things resonate among, among capitalist countries in a way that sometimes Chinese policies don't, because Chinese don't always adhere to, the, to those things. Um, they have a, a, a big checkbook, but in a sense, the difference between you know, the old saw about giving a person a fish as opposed to teaching them how to fish, I mean, 
we're much more in the latter camp. We want to work with, with countries on economic development. We think that, that cooperation will, is synergistic and will help both societies. You know, we're not in, in the business of, of just you know, taking natural resources. Uh, we're in the interest of, of, of an economic harmony where we all grow together. So I think that's a, that's, that's, I, I like that competition because I like our point of view in that. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah, please. Um. So, uh, as the Russia-Ukrainian crisis is bringing both Europe and America closer together, would you say that this could be the right time for finally working out and signing the transatlantic free trade agreement? Um, I, I do. Um, I think this is a, offers a good impetus for it. I think it's it's beneficial to all parties. I mean, there are every country has its own domestic considerations, but again, the idea of of economic cooperation, the idea of treaties, is that is that you know you have to make certain take certain risks uh, because you think it, it will cause greater growth and greater harmony. And I think each of the countries that are party to it need, needs to take that risk and 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 sign it. Uh, it might be interesting to continue that discussion, but we only have five minutes and we will get into GMO issues and all that sort of thing, but uh, it's an interesting one. Um, in any case, uh, we'll get to TFP. Yes, uh, so um, we have uh, five minutes left, so uh, maybe we can, uh, any other remaining questions, uh, we'll all ask them at once and then uh, Mr. Stengel will have an opportunity to sort of uh, answer all of them at I once. Can remember right. All right. Yeah, okay. I'll try to help you. Okay. Well, my question is uh, connected with the correlation between public diplomacy and the dimension of international security. Well, we can say that in Ukraine we saw some sort of uh, new <laughs> new warfare, which several international relations experts actually uh, say that it's some sort of fourth generation, where actually occupation, annexation of Crimea weren't done using the traditional hard power elements, uh, however, but using the strong uh, Russian uh, propaganda machine which uh, supported secessionist movements there, which actually was the starting phase. Uh, so my question actually is uh, connected uh, with your personal opinion. Uh, should the, um, actually the NATO's Article 5, which you mentioned as the rock-solid agreement between the United States as, as its allies, be reformed in order to actually um, to actually fight these new security challenges and which are not connected to hard power anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? So uh, please. Your last opportunity to ask questions, guys. So come up here. Yeah, sure. I would like to ask a more uh, general question, I think, uh, which is about the happenings which we see now uh, in our nowadays world. Like uh, we have seen uh, the revolutions in the Arabic countries. We have seen the we see the revolution going on in Syria. We see what is happening in Ukraine. And uh, I, I think next to all those interests states having, maybe on these countries, on why these, these things are happening, we see so many people dying day by day. Um, we see uh, Europe and uh, America sanctioning now, for example, uh, uh, every day from, from beginning the uh, um, Russian government and people in Russia. What other possibilities do we have and how far should the, like the whole world society, not only America and Europe, intervene in these things, and uh, in which manner, how quick, how fast, how, um, in which power should they intervene, that people, um, that killing of people stops, and not only uh, trying to be uh, good with in, in the relations between the countries. Um. Yeah, uh, anything else? Uh, please, a very quick one. Uh, that will be the last one as well. Um, recently, there was a huge study which caused a big uproar in the media, basically, which concluded that the US is not a real democracy anymore, and the interests of business groups and powerful individuals are being represented by the government. So I was thinking whether you could comment on that. So about Article 5, in light of recent uh, uh, <coughs> developments on humanitarian intervention, right. I think that was a, a broad question, and on, on the quality of American democracy. Mm. The, um, I'll take the first two questions first, because they're, they're sort of related. I mean, the way I would connect them is that 
Article 5 is, is a, is, represents a specific response to a specific traditional circumstance. Something like sanctions are a response to the kind of non-traditional circumstance that we're seeing in Ukraine. What we're seeing, U Ukraine doesn't trigger Article 5, but it is a new kind of, of combat, a new kind of aggression. So how do you answer that? You don't answer it with a traditional response that's, that's, that is promulgated in Article 5, but you answer it with, with a new, new fangled kind of response uh, of, of sanctions. And I think what the, what the President is doing is he's trying to gauge the level of response given the, the level of action there. There are uh, sanctions that we've seen that are more surgical. There are sanctions that are potentially anticipated if Russia, for example, dis disrupts the election on May 25th. Uh, stricter, harsher sanctions, more sectoral sanctions, those are possible. That's all part of the, the way the, the the United States is calibrating its, its reaction. I do think, again, going back to Article 5, if there's that traditional violation that triggers Article 5, we will absolutely be there um, in every way possible. Um, the, the situation in Syria is also one which is, which is, again, complex. It's difficult. There aren't any easy answers. I, I, I know that the President is personally upset about what happens in Syria. I know the Secretary of State is. There just haven't been the kind of uh, easy responses that sometimes a, a kind of more emotional response to what's going on there is something that people are asking for. Um, to go to the question about, about, about American democracy, you know, uh, again, more than 200 years ago in the American Constitution, the idea was you know, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. The, the idea is that America is always in pursuit of a more perfect union. It is always trying to perfect itself. The president has talked about, a shorthand of what you're talking about is, is economic inequality in America, which is something we're seeing all across, you know, all across the world, and particularly in first world countries. I mean, the, the fact that, that we pointed to this problem, the fact that there, are, that there are things that we're trying to do to rectify it, it is to me, it's not the solution, but it's, it's part of the battle. And I think the, the point of any democracy um, you know, as Ben Franklin, you know, said when, when the Constitution was, was signed, it's a, it's a democracy if you can keep it. That's what I think every democracy is obligated to do. You have to refresh those values in every generation, and combating economic inequality is, is, is one of the battles now of the 21st century. And we're out of time. Uh, so, um, I, we should have had a, um, a voting system set up uh, to measure American uh, attractiveness and soft power before the lecture and after the lecture. Yes. I think uh, there's a good chance that it might have increased um, <laughs> because of the gallant efforts of Richard Stangle, uh, whom we thank very much for, uh, for having this discussion with us.